Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range U.S. focused forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. I want to start you off here. This is a map showing you total precipitation anomalies or differences from normal from April 15th through June 30th. I was having a great conversation with a colleague of mine discussing the, you know, what 2019's growing season looked like. We decided to make these maps to help understand it. Now, when you look at this, we can clearly see that we can kind of paint the corners dry. So parts of the Pacific Northwest started off uh, spring and summer dry and same thing for parts of the Southeast. But that extremely active jet stream that's dipped into the South and then raced through the the middle part of the country brought precipitation anomalies that range from five to in some locations over 20 inches greater than normal. I'm talking about parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, extremely wet into this area. It was wet in Texas as well to start the season, even though they finished the season very dry. Look at this. This is now June 30th to just a couple of days ago. What do we notice? Well, Texas went into drought. We had a dry stretch in July and early August that went from parts of um, Iowa through Illinois, Indiana, up into Michigan, and it got really hot and steamy down here in parts of the Mid-South, so Tennessee and Kentucky. But if you just go back and forth, you can see the intersection in the mid part of the United States where the early season deep trough out west raced through that area, taking the jet stream right up to the northeast, and then the big ridge set up here later in the year, bringing the flow around it just like this, cutting across. In other words, the jet stream cut across in this direction throughout later summer and this direction early summer. And when you put all this together, this is what it did in terms of our precipitation ranks. Take a look at the map on the right. Anywhere that you see this color, that is a region, a division that had its wettest March through August time period on record. And there's a lot of areas in the middle section of the country that are seeing all-time records smashed. At the same time, look at temperatures. We were cool in here while very warm out west at times and very warm in the southeast and along the east coast. This is just my way of kind of summarizing how we've gotten to so far by looking at March through August. And it is an area, or a map, a set of maps, I should say, that show me that this year we saw multiple repeated stressors on our crops, especially those grown uh, in the mid part of the country. That's not to say that the southeast and the southern region didn't get their share of heat and drought, but it's just to show you how wildly fluctuating things were. Now, talking about precipitation, we are not done. Here's some of the storms early this morning, about 4.45 in the morning, running through the north central plains and parts of the western Corn Belt. And they were extremely active. When you add it up over the two hour time period here, there was nearly 25,000 lightning strikes in parts of South Dakota, Nebraska, getting into Iowa and Minnesota. And these storms are gonna continue to roll throughout the day. Now, yesterday, some of these storms were nasty. I know this is supposed to be a long-range forecast, but i got to show you this. 143 reports of severe weather, 13 tornadoes, but some massive hail in some of these storms. Some of our maximum estimated hail sizes here getting over 4 inches, especially there in parts of Wyoming, and that verified. This was sent to the National Weather Service in Cheyenne. That's a four inch hailstone. And that one came out of this storm right here. So here you are, uh, Fort Laramie. You can see you're just north here. Uh, in, in eastern parts of, of uh, Wyoming. And remember, when you see over 60 dBZ, that's this kind of area I've outlined in pink here. Yeah, that's hail. But right in here, I saw some of these darker pixels. One of them hit 73 dBZ. So that tells me that this sucker was producing some very large hail. Later on in the day, look at what the storms did as they moved across parts of northern Nebraska. We actually had five. Look, count them. One, two, three, four, five supercells kind of on parade here moving through this section of Nebraska. And what was most intriguing to me is to see their outflow. Do you see the outflow from each storm? Look at how it all came together right in through here. Now, I don't know how many of you like to turn wrenches in your garages on the weekend, or you like working on cars and trucks, but I do. This is one of my favorite hobbies. And I'll tell you something. When I look at this, I see an exhaust header. Do you all see that as well? There's the collection pipe, each one 
on the one side of a V8 there. Okay, sorry, let's get beyond that. Okay, this is how much rain we've got in the last three days. And we can see that parts of the central United States, I'm talking parts of Nebraska, South Dakota, and uh, uh, also Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, even parts of southern Wisconsin, excuse me, and Iowa uh, here have received anywhere between one and in some locations over five inches of rain. Meanwhile, the southeast hit or miss storms. The northeast got a little bit of a break here, although North Carolina took a beating a couple of days ago. And each one of these storms that's come into the northwest has really dumped some very, very heavy rainfall. This is what we're expecting to add to it over the next three days. Now, some of the rain that you see here is falling early this morning, but the potential exists for adding into that area starting early this morning through the next three days, another three to five inches of rainfall. Very, very heavy rainfall. Now, adding to that, the tropics are quite active. We have a couple of systems we need to be watching. First one here is just currently sitting as a group of, you know, less than organized thunderstorms north of the island of Hispaniola. But there is some model agreement that this will get organized and the potential track for this heavier rainfall could be somewhere uh, in the vicinity of the two arrows I just drew. We need to be watching the systems that are following it as well. Take a look at the storm tracks here by the European Ensemble. First of all, we can see that what's sitting north of the island of Hispaniola does appear to take some sort of track like this. So this corridor here, once we get out beyond you know, the, the end of this week into early next week could be seeing some very wet conditions moving through Florida and then into the lower Mississippi River Valley. So we're going to keep a close eye on that. And secondly, while we don't yet fully know and understand where this particular, um, you know, low pressure system is going to go, it does appear that it could be moving into more favorable conditions once we get out about a week from right now, seeing where this is uh, going to be moving into parts of the Caribbean and over the greater Antilles. So we've got some active tropical weather to be watching. Why is it acting that way? Well, right now, things are relatively suppressed in this area. So upper levels of the atmosphere working hard against letting a lot of the convection really go. But look at what happens once we get out to the five to 10 day time period. We start to see the upper levels of the atmosphere really allowing for better, we can almost think of this as allowing the storms to exhaust better in the upper levels of the atmosphere. We can see it not only from the GFS model, but from some statistical techniques and as well as the European model. Bring in and you see the blue spreading here with time. So this is week one and week two. We're going to be letting the atmosphere uh, better produce tropical convection. That's what I'm saying here uh, in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico, and in the Western Atlantic. So conditions are becoming more favorable, which they typically do this time of year in that area. But I want to bring your attention back to this. See this area right in through here? Where you see those greens, that tells me that the upper levels of the atmosphere are, are, are letting air rise. And so we have a lot of rising motion right in this area. And it's interesting to understand why. So this is called a Hoffmuller diagram. I show them to you quite a bit. We have longitude running this direction. So right here, this is on the international dateline in the middle of the Pacific. And we have time. This is forecast go this way. And this is looking backwards in time that way. Now what's going on right now is look at this. I have this region of blues here and a region of reds there. The blues indicate easterly winds, so winds coming from the east, and these reds indicate strong westerly winds. And you can see that they meet right in this area, and that is sitting on the international dateline. So what's going on here is right at 180 degrees, we're getting air to rise very rapidly. And why this is important is this is actually telling us that neither El Nino nor La Nina seems to be dominating the flow of the atmosphere right now. It's something else, and I want to talk about that something else. Okay, as we look forward, one of the major features that will be controlling North American weather once we get here deep into September is what you see right here. It's this deeper trough that the model's been advertising now for several days, forming in the third week of the month that's going to be sitting right here somewhere in the Gulf of Alaska. Now, in the last few model runs, the GFS model has taken this trough and allowed it to kind of retrograde or move back to the west. That means that into the third week of September here, this could potentially build in some big heat out west. And because it slid this thing to the west a little bit, this now is going to allow for some cooler air to come back into the eastern half of the United States. Now remember, this is a pretty long range forecast and so much of this forecast depends on the models getting this right. If, um, you know, if it's not there, then this changes everything. Uh, let me give you a couple of different scenarios. If we were to take this 
and shove it a little bit deeper, farther to the south. That'll take this ridge and push it farther to the north, and that could potentially bring in much colder air to the east coast. If this trough is more progressive and it's sitting closer to the west coast, take the heat that the west coast is experiencing in this forecast and shove it here over the mid part of the country, really erasing all fear of any sort of a, a frost across the midsection of the United States. I don't want to hype this pattern up too much, but I'll just tell you something. This has been a pretty consistent feature, which we're all going to have to be watching in the near term. Now, speaking of near term, look at this. This is to start you off next week. Deep trough over the western United States and a huge ridge over the Great Lakes. And look at what that's doing to our temperature patterns. Over the next five days, that's what's over here on the left, still active jet stream pattern doing this. Folks that are to the south of that jet stream, much above average temperatures. It's going to feel more like July than it is going to be feeling like September in that area. Next week, day 6 through 10 forecast. This is when the deeper trough sets up and that large ridge is in place. And look at the above average temperatures we're expecting around the Great Lakes states. Some locations here anywhere between 10 and maybe as much as 15 degrees warmer than average. So very, very highly amplified pattern. But as we said, as we get out here to the 11 to 15 day forecast time period, the trough is sitting in through here, the ridge builds, but what we need to be watching out for is how deep this trough is in this location. Now, some wild card factors here. I've taken, honestly, I'm not talking too much about what's going on over Greenland. If we start to get bridging over Greenland, that's going to shove even more cold air into this area. Not currently forecast, but that's something to be watching. But as I said, you need to watch with me if this progresses to the east or to the west with time or changes at all in its amplitude. That's our biggest wild cards moving forward. I'll say this too, the long range European model taking out through week three and week four, as well as the CFS V2, which is the model I'm showing you here, they can't seem to be able to shake the position of that trough, which means it may be a feature we watch all the way through the end of the month. Now the CFS V2 wants to keep that trough in place and then bring a much broader ridge through the north central part of the United States. Whereas the GFS may, or excuse me, the ECMWF may give a little bit more of a shove by the time we get into the fourth week of the month into a trough that hits the Great Lakes. What could go wrong with all of this forecast? Well, a lot of things. If the models have overdone the amplification of that trough here, that changes everything. If we start to see bigger ridging happening over Greenland, that changes it all as well. In fact, a big ridge over Greenland with this setup could really cause some problems here for the eastern half of the United States with some really cold air coming in. We're not seeing it right now, but it could. And finally, the tropics both in the Atlantic as well as what's going on in the Pacific could ultimately disrupt this entire pattern and give us an entirely different look by the end of the month. That is all up in the air at this point. But right now at this stage, I think what you need to be paying attention to me, you know, talking about over the next 10 days is whether or not the models are consistent with the placement of that trough. Again, it's east to west movement and its depth will tell us everything about the potential for having above average temperatures or cooler than average temperatures across the United States. That is the ultimate determining factor at this stage. What's interesting about the placement of that trough is it's actually quite consistent with this ocean pattern, at least part of it. What I'm talking about here specifically is this. You can see the cooler water in through there with the warmer water in this kind of reverse C shape here in the North Pacific. That's called the positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation plus PDO. Now what's crazy about this is normally when we are in such a positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, we don't have cool water in the Central Pacific. It looks as though there's a bit of a La Nina emerging there, but there isn't. It's just some cooler water on the surface, and we saw what the atmosphere is doing. It's not behaving like El Nino or La Nina. Let me throw a third monkey wrench into this. See the cooler water here and the warmer water there? That's the positive phase of the Indian Ocean dipole. Normally, when the PDO is positive, we have positive ENSO, and we can also see the behavior of the Indian Ocean dipole looking something like this. But it's all three of these things are almost out of phase with one another right now. And the translation is, this suggests that our longer term forecasting ability is much below average because of it. So we, we, I have no confidence in any long range forecast at this particular point, given these three features working against one another, in fact.
But that deep trough that I keep talking about, that's sitting right in through here, is very consistent with the positive PDO uh, setup. We also need to look at this, the long range forecast for El Nino. Well, when I showed you this over the last month or so, the forecast at that point was to take it right down here, still keeping it in inso neutral territory, but much closer to the La Nina side of things, which is down here, and away from the El Nino side of things, which is up here. Well, what's the latest model run done? Kept things a bit more neutral when you average them all together, but is now keeping it much closer to the warmer side of things. Now that's consistent because normally with all the water, the hot water you see in here, and I'm sorry, my drawing's getting a bit messy, it tends to erode away on the cooler water that surfaces in that area. So this means our long range forecasting without a dominant El Nino signal and competing factors in the North Pacific is gonna be quite challenging. Still, I'm gonna show you what the global models are suggesting. And in these next three images, we're gonna look specifically at precipitation. And the main reason why is because, remember last harvest, how wet things were? Well, I wanna talk about that now. Well, this September, wherever you see these colors, this is wetter than average, these colors drier than average, okay? When we look at this, we already know that this is the pattern that's gonna be sub defining September because we're already 11 days into it. We know this is what's gonna happen. The wild card for the Southeast though will be tropical systems. We just don't know where they're gonna form and go just yet. But we already know how wet things are in this corridor. In the month of October, look at what the longer range models, and this is primarily driven by the ECMWF are suggesting. Very wet in this kind of reverse C shape here. This again is due to that trough that we're expecting to form there and possibly stick around for a while. That could keep a very active pattern. That same pattern might keep this area on a slight dry bias. And many of us in that section of the country would be happy to see that dry bias as we're trying to get this crop out of the ground. But maybe a more active end of our season here with respect to tropical activity along the southeast coast. Into November, same thing. But now the long range models are trying to keep this corridor and this corridor wet. Again, take all of this with a big grain of salt because right now the global teleconnections are giving us a bit of a crazy picture. If we try to finish this up by giving a winter forecast, I'll tell you what I do. You often don't ever hear me give long range forecasts beyond maybe six weeks at the most. And that's because I rarely trust my forecast beyond two weeks. So giving a long range forecast, I'll at least tell you what the major drivers are. Right here, we do have a positive PDO. That's what we just talked about. Inso neutral, these two things don't work normally together, so that's confusing to a lot of long range forecast. Quasi biennial oscillation, we're looking here at the way that the winds are flowing in the, deep in the atmosphere. While it is positive right now, it's been fading throughout summer, and we need to pay attention to what's going on with our atmospheric angular momentum. It's been way, way, way below average th since uh, July, and we need to know if it's gonna change. These now, these factors are in competition with each other right now. Because of that, one of our global models called CANSIPS, this is a, a model run in Canada, wants to advertise this pattern, a high over low, building into a ridge out west and a trough over the east coast. So this would keep this region cool, I'll put a C in it, but it would keep this area, I don't know, let's just switch over to a different color here, we'll use red, keep this area dry, and also this area dry, but cool in that area in the northeast. Now that's just one model run. Let me show you what the European is saying about all of this. The European model, along with several of the models in, uh, that are part of the National Multimodel Ensemble, they wanna do something a bit different. They wanna keep a lot of cooler air tucked in through here, and maybe keep the flow pattern doing a bit more like this. Now if that's the case, that's gonna keep this area very, very active in terms of storm track. That's gonna also allow for some pretty cold air to be coming in through this corridor early in our winter. I say take all of this at face value because we know what dominates our winter. It's the sub-seasonal weather impacts, polar vortex disruptions, the progression of the Madden Julian oscillation, what's going on with the EPO, the WPO, the PNA, and the NAO. Yes, that was a bunch of nerd speak for our nearby uh, um, uh, teleconnection patterns. All of these, at most, we've got three weeks Sorry, my handwriting is awful, but three weeks forecastability on any of that. So we're just going to have to watch it carefully and keep a close eye on it. But you're going to start to hear a lot of folks discussing long-range forecasts. So I just want to help uh, keep some perspective on it. Okay, we'll go ahead and wrap this video up right here. I hope you all have a great week and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you.